it's always a privilege to engage on these topics uh, with, with folks uh, such as yourselves. Um, for me, it's just really an opportunity to reflect um, on these topics because I, I have a sense that many of the things we talk about are things you've spoke, you've sort of engaged in uh, on your own or that you actually are quite familiar with. So this is really just an opportunity for us to engage on these, to bring them back to the front of your mind. And I realize now I'm also the first speaker, so I'm pleased to open the session. If Margot had told me, I would have worn something fancier to, to mark the occasion. So this is really just a broad overview. I'm gonna just uh, introduce the background, uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the key uh, uh, disorders that uh, are relevant, talk about how mental health relates to the work environment. And I think uh, most helpfully, I hope, will be some strategies for um, workers and some strategies for leaders to address uh, mental health concerns in the workplace. Um, we are well aware of the global prevalence of, of depression as of 2015 of 4.4%. And we're also aware that um, males tend to be reflected as being less prevalent than females. Now, we know that that probably is an underrepresentation. It might very well be equal uh, because males have, uh, have um, other patterns of help seeking and therefore uh, being picked up as having these concerns. So one might find if one spreads one, one's techniques for collecting this sort of data that this rate is actually somewhat higher. So depression in general, again, as I've said, this is uh, information that you are privy to. I think it's important for us to make ourselves aware of the difference between depression and just normal sadness. Depression does consist of feelings of hopelessness, sadness, uh, numbness, and uh, also consists of uh, feeling of displays of fatigue, crying unexpectedly, uh, decreased interest in activities that were previously enjoyable, uh, changes uh, in, in appetite or body weight or some somatic and physical symptoms, and there may also be thoughts of suicide or self-harm. This is by no means um, an exhaustive list, just to highlight the key elements of, of depressive illness. And of course, it differs from normal sadness in that it is pervasive and lasts a longer period and has a, a greater impact on functioning, uh, uh, impacting on the ways we engage with our families, with our partners, with our work, um, etc. So some of the risk factors for depression uh, are family history and genetics, and we'll talk a little bit about how that interfaces with stress in a moment. Death or loss, so it may be a complication of grief may result from conflict. Um, there may be abuse, which uh, may be past physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Uh, this is something that's really coming to the fore in our minds now as we're seeing the unfolding tragedies in Krugerstorp. Um, life events, uh, so uh, positive, uh, sometimes some life events can precipitate depression um, and other events such as a new job, loss of employment, uh, income, marriage, divorce, retirement. So definitely meant negative life events, the apologies for the typo. So in other illnesses as well may result um, in depression or in the, in, it may precipitate depression uh, and it may also result from the use of certain medications. Anxiety on the other hand has a similar prevalence uh, globally and I would have the same reflections in terms of how it's presenting uh, for uh, males versus that for females. And specifically for anxiety, the overwhelming um, uh, presenting features are that feeling of a sense of impending doom, uh, excessive worrying uh, that is at a degree that is dysfunctional and impacts on someone's ability to carry out day-to-day -day functioning and work responsibilities. Difficulty concentrating, again, fatigue, uh, restlessness and um, racing thoughts. So I think the important thing to remember here is similarly for depression where someone can be sad, but it's not depression. You can also be anxious like I was before this talk. I'm anxious before every talk because you wanna make sure you deliver something that is uh, helpful to the folks who are giving you their time. So there's that. And then when the event takes place, there's a, there's, there's a dissipation of that anxiety. Uh, whereas with, with uh, pathological anxiety, um, it, it, it does have a far more pervasive course and requires uh, uh, intervention, which can occasionally in, involve pharmacotherapy. 
So anxiety disorders really include disorders that share the features of excessive fear, so excessive being the key uh, term, and anxiety and are related uh, to behavioral disturbances. So some examples of some uh, anxiety disorders include separation anxiety disorder, um, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and um, you can see the list there. Again, I'm sure that most folks on the call are aware of uh, some of these. Some of the risk factors for anxiety disorders are having previously experienced uh, or having witnessed or, or having knowledge of a traumatic event, a history of another mental health disorder, a history of uh, dissociative reactions to past traumatic events, uh, young age, being female, and the use of substances. Um, and so, of course, and also other, uh, so I thought I found out, sort of been popping up here, and other avoidance and occupational factors. Protective factors which apply to both are the extent to which someone has access to social support, um, coping strategies uh, that have been uh, employed already and uh, have been successful in supporting the person and have yielded positive outcomes in the past, as well as engagement in physical activity. And this was going to be reflected in the slides later on when I speak about recommendations for individuals. Um, so in terms of uh, common mental disorders, uh, so what I want to make sure that we also talk about is um, uh, substance use disorders. But before I get there, the last uh, in sort of countrywide ep epidemiological survey was the SASH study, which was done way too long ago. Um, so this data was, was published in, in 2000, where is it now? I'm losing the year, 2008, 2009, whereabouts. So this was the last uh, sort of representative population level survey. And you can see here that it, it demonstrated quite a high prevalence of, men, of common mental disorders. Uh, so all disorders, 30.8% uh, of the sample um, with uh, anxiety, mood and depression uh, presenting in that order and the Western Cape presenting with the highest uh, level of substance use disorder. And this is something that we continue to see uh, in terms of uh, treatment demand data reflecting a continuation of this. But we certainly need to update this data. But this is just a reflection on where our country sat at that time uh, following the survey. The interesting thing to note um, about um, the substance use uh, data and substance use disorder data for South Africa is that the rate of use is mirrors that of other settings. So it's not different. However, the, the rate of harms is higher in South Africa. So our relationship with alcohol is, 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 is clearly quite uh, detrimental to health outcomes. We saw now during COVID when uh, there was a restriction in access to alcohol, how um, the rate of folks presenting with trauma related to alcohol was significantly reduced. Uh, we're also aware of the historic DOP system in the Western Cape where folks were paid in alcohol, resulting in fetal alcohol syndrome. So these are just some of the harms, some related to risk and outcomes in HIV. So to backtrack now, we've started in reverse, I guess, by talking about some of the disorders. But if we backtrack and talk about, well, what is mental health? Um, so mental health, according to World Health Organization, is a state of well-being where an individual can realize their potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, um, can work productively and fruitfully, and contribute to uh, their own um, su uh, success and to their communities. Whereas if one goes more broadly and talks about mental well-being, so mental slash psychological well-being is a core feature of mental health and can be uh, defined as including elements which are, you know, called hedonic, so related to enjoyment or pleasure, uh, related to uh, experiences which generate a sense of meaning and fulfillment, as, and happiness, as well as factors which um, relate to resilience. So in terms of coping, emotional regulation, um, healthy problem solving uh, practices. So well-being is really defined as a combination of, of feeling good, functioning well, um, the experience of positive emotions, such as happiness and contentment, as well as the development of one's own potential and having a sense 
that there's some control over one's life, um, having a sense that they have a, a purpose in their day-to-day -day functioning and experiencing relationships positively. So then how does one then move from uh, mental health, mental wellness to, um, to mental health challenges? So we spoke about the, well, some of the risk factors being that genetic predisposition. So there might be a family history uh, of mental health in general or specifically around common mental disorders. There are many possible precipitants um, I'll, on the next slide, I'll just show some of the ones that are related to work, which is the focus of our talk today. But these are multifaceted in nature and they interact um, differentially with that genetic predisposition and interface with someone's access to resources that helps them to manage um, the distress caused by um, some of the triggers. Um, so the triggers may be external, uh, so they might come from someone's social or you know romantic life or uh, external to the work environment essentially, or it may originate from the work environment. So uh, we'll talk about some of the strategies that uh, management or leadership can put in place to mitigate some of the experience of, uh, of work-based uh, exposure to uh, risks. Our environments are changing a lot. I'm sitting in Cape Town right now in my spare room talking to you, and all of you are sitting in all sorts of uh, various locations. So technology has really caused a significant change in how we interact. So for some of us, that does create some comfort because we're comfortable with technology. Some folks might experience uh, technological evolution as traumatic and, and challenging. Um, so you know the, the technological changes in in in, um, in our work environment are, are are significant. Climate change has changed the way uh, you know we inter the, just the work environment in general. Uh, globalization means, um, uh, for example, we work with folks who are in different time zones. So you might find yourself sitting in a meeting at nine p.m. where somebody's at six a.m. That really messes with one's routine, which is something we advocate for. Um, balancing one's um, uh, sort of day-to-day -day in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that is oriented towards self-care. We're also finding work environments changing demographically. Um, some of the uh, reflected uh, 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 pickups in the, in the literature are that uh, the work environment uh, consists of older folks uh, who've been in, uh, in, in the space longer. So we are seeing more diversity and more feminization in the space. And this obviously has impact uh, in terms of uh, when staff is, is, is occasionally not available due to um, uh, perhaps maternity leave. That diversity uh, has an impact in terms of us having to be more sensitive around specific areas that perhaps we were not initially. So that those demographic changes have really changed the um, this, the workspace and increased the chances of, um, of, of 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 difficult, challenging, or traumatic experience. Of course, right now we're all very relieved that the petrol prices dropped ever so slightly, but the increasing cost of living is certainly something that continues to be um, a, a stressor for all of us while our incomes remain fairly um, unchanged. So we spoke about that genetic vulnerability. So, and also we spoke about uh, those risk factors versus those protective factors. So the vulnerability resilience stress model speaks about how a stressor, uh, such as the ones we've just discussed about the changing workspace, interfaces with um, how the risk factors increase vulnerability to that stress or the impact of that stress, while the protective factors increase the, the resilience to that stress and mitigate whether or not, depending on how these balance out, a health problem um, then manifests. So in terms of mental health challenges related to the workplace, um, an average of 36 workdays are lost uh, for each episode, uh, and more than 10% um, of working people have taken time off uh, for depression. Um, this is international data. The data is limited for South Africa, and I'm sure this is something that we'll all work on um, at PD and, uh, and SADAC and other partners to make sure we get some more current data for the workforce in South Africa. 
but Alexander Forbes, who do have some published data, show that 35% of all temporary incapacity leave uh, submissions are mental health related, and 25% of extended leave, so to an average of 18 days, the request were for mental health concerns. So uh, again, this is not going to be surprising to you that the uh, the main pickups that we see um, are for in depression and anxiety, which can be related to external environmental um, uh, triggers, not necessarily it can be trauma, but triggers as well as work-related trauma. And of course, substance use disorders, uh, either as a uh, sequelae of um, or of of, uh, of of stresses outside the workplace, or indeed occupational substance misuse, uh, which is something that we we, if we're honest, does take place. A little bit of a typo there. My apologies. So, what is the impact? Again, not surprising here is uh, absenteeism uh, and lost time, um, as well as reduced occupational functioning. So. We also know that you know, there'll be reduced functional uh, or there'll be a functional limitation. There'll be loss of productive hours. Um, there'll be challenges with communication with workers, which in itself uh, there's a risk of causing additional trauma to other workers, uh, resulting in additional mental health concerns for the uh, work environment generally. Of course, we also know individually uh, there's healthcare costs. Many of us subsidize our own care. Uh, as well as income replacement costs, um, you know, in, in case somebody has to take time off uh, that is not paid. At an organizational level, there are questions around compensation and standing costs. So these are by no means exhaustive, but just some of the impact uh, of mental health, mental unwellness in the workplace. When it comes to interventions, um, the challenges uh, are that ultimately. It, the impact uh, or success of these interventions is dependent on um, employee power to impact their work environment. So you'll see some of the recommendations I make really put the um, uh, the the, the so part of the responsibility of tackling the environment to create a more conducive uh, working space, uh, you know, to to the worker. But one has to keep in mind that not all employees have an equal power to actually impact that work environment, which then means that uh, management needs to create spaces that are uh, worker friendly. Um, lack of managerial competence and training, and certainly willingness or insight to uh, to understand the need to create spaces that are mental health friendly, um, and in general for us as managers is, is knowing when you don't know so that you are able to then mobilize the appropriate resources. And of course, poor availability of resources and structures, which may be um, uh, a resource limitation uh, linked to funding and budgeting. Strategies should ideally involve intersectoral collaboration. So there's no need for companies to create um, islands of intervention. Uh, it's important in any event for society to function well that we are uh, we facilitate intersectoral um, uh, collaborations where we bring in the social sector, the health sector, and create interventions that ultimately will benefit the the not just the organization but the community at large. And of course, the integration then of well-being outcomes into organizational policy and practice measures. One of the debates uh, I've had with some of my colleagues is about whether you know, we should be more explicit in including wellness outcomes in job descriptions, because if someone's task is to actually ensure that they uh, are mentally well and supported, then it's something they can continue to, to strive to, um, uh, to seek out. So some of the um, interventions that have been um, promulgated to support mental illness in the workplace can be arranged in, um, in these four domains. So in terms of health-focused interventions, so interventions that are specifically targeting health outcomes, um, so, and these facilitate the delivery of health services to workers, these include um, graded activity or exercise, um, which we'll talk about, cognitive behavior therapy, targeting specific work-related um, work uh, uh, concerns, um, work hardening, um, 
which which re refers to a highly structured programs designed to help patients return to pre-injury work. So if somebody has had to leave work, so this is just structured programming to help them reintegrate. So that's work hardening, as well as multi-component health-focused interventions, which consider other comprehensive me medical assessment, physical therapy, psychological therapy, occupational therapy. So those are health-focused interventions. Service coordination interventions. So this, this really uh, speaks to this intersectoral collaboration piece, really involve coordination and delivery of and access to services to support return to work. A lot of organizations might say, well, that's a big investment for us to make. But if one then looks at uh, some of the impact um, and, and the impact that this might have on the company's bottom line, a company that actually invests uh, resources in coordinating access to services might actually find there's a, that, that there's a, a, a return on investment there. Hopefully in one of my future talks, I can include some of those economic factors so we can actually uh, discuss those. Some of these examples are development of return to work plans, uh, uh, which incorporate um, some of uh, these considerations. Um, case management, uh, education and training of the staff as well as management. In terms of work modification interventions, it's really about reorganizing work uh, and working conditions, which again, we've got some practice now following two years of COVID, we've had to really reorganize our work and, re and, and reorient ourselves around what is actual performance, what is delivery of, our, of, of, um, of, of work outcomes. So uh, examples includes modified duties, modified working hours, modification of where somebody works, um, and, and sort of looking at supernumerary replacement, adjusting the, open, the, the uh, work environment to be more ergonomically friendly, um, and other work site uh, engagement. And then multi-domain just includes uh, a combination of the above. So really, the take-home here is that the main intervention uh, domains that have been found in the literature are health-focused, related to service coordination, related to modifying the work uh, environment, and then a combination of those. So in terms of the evidence, um, this is a great table that was uh, published by these amazing people a couple of years ago. Um, so they looked at um, the level of evidence. Um, so I only included the ones that, that demonstrated strong positive um, or strong no effect uh, in terms of uh, uh, impact. So we see here that multi-domain interventions um, were the strongest when this is no surprise to us in that one wants to be comprehensive when one plans interventions to support mental health in the workplace. So it's no surprise to us that the multi-domain um, interventions uh, yielded uh, the strongest positive and impacted mostly on lost time. It's also no surprise that work-focused CBT for mental health conditions uh, were also found to be strongly co correlated to better outcomes uh, in terms of mental health in the workplace. Because again, if you, in, you know, in the workplace, one wants to be mindful of, um, of being um, protective of the work environment by avoiding high expressed emotion and, and limiting, uh, uh, well, not necessarily limiting, but being mindful to, to not uh, cause triggers uh, beyond the workplace. So one wants to be focused on on what the interventions are targeting within the work, workplace. I hope that makes sense. It's in the evening now, so my English bundles are not what they are in the daytime. Um, so to, to go to take this further, um, in terms of so this slide, yes, I remember where I put the slide. So it's to say that ultimately interventions to improve the mental health um, uh, situation in the workplace is a team effort. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that just the manager is going to put in place and everything's going to work uh, fantastically or that the team must sort out or that the, you know, the, the, the workers must sort out and then everything will be hunky-dory. It actually is a team effort. And so I'm gonna talk about strategies um, for workers, which uh, will include some individual um, strategies. And then I'll talk about some leadership strategies and then if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some specific recommend, recommendation that my team and I um, really quite like. So 
for workers, you know, I mentioned earlier that some of the limiting factors are for workers' um, perception of their ability to impact um, on their work environment. So this first bullet I place being fully aware of that everyone's power might differ in the workplace. But ultimately, in order to ensure a mental health responsive workspace, it's important for workers to advocate for the provision of services and capacity building. So, uh, you know, engagement such as this one to really uh, bring things to the to the front of folks' minds, but also specific capacity building around detection and uh, brief intervention and supportive strategies. Uh, I'll allude to some of those in a moment. Workers then actually need to participate in employer offered programs. So if it's offered, it's only as good as being accessed. So you have to actually then take advantage of it, um, you know, but again, the the uh, likelihood that uh, workers will take advantage deter is determined really by the extent to which the environment has been um, facilitated as a supportive one that is safe for the workers to do that. So this is why it's really a partnership. So uh, one hand washes the other here. And uh, hopefully when I speak about the leadership's role, it, it will uh, bring this together. And workers need to be willing to serve as wellness champions and engage in trainings when that are offered to upskill them to do that effectively. Um, one of the things that's come out of COVID again is we've all been forced to ask each other quite genuinely, how are you doing and how are you feeling and how are you coping with things? And so I think we've suddenly inadvertently had practice now in how to be each other's wellness champions. So we need to be willing as workers to engage uh, uh, for the for the for the for the mental health of our colleagues um, and ourselves, and then it's to tackle stigma through responsible sharing of personal experience. You know, the workspace is a is a is is a, a balancing act because we do bring ourselves to the workplace. So there has to be an element of okay, you know, Goodman is here. I can talk to Goodman. So, but at the end of the day, one must then be responsible to protect the workspace so that it it, it doesn't descend into uh, an overly personalized space. And that requires training and the provision of resources. And that is the responsibility of management to put in place uh, in collaboration with workers. And it's also to then practice uh, active and empathic listening. And that this is what, uh, you know, that kind of looks like, uh, you know, is staying focused on what someone is listening to, is, is sharing with you. Uh, you know, it's very easy to start going into examples about yourself and then and then uh, forgetting to pay attention to the person who's telling you what's going on. So to stay focused, uh, to to empathize, uh, to provide unconditional positive regard, uh, and where appropriate to then share uh, focused uh, and clear information, particularly about how to access resources within the company uh, for for support. Um, and then just to clarify. Uh, this is just to, to to be clear about why you are uh, sort of uh, asking certain questions or reframing certain specific uh, uh, sharings. And this is just about active listening. So being mindful when you're listening about your posture, how you're speaking, how you're sitting. Um, uh, you know, you, ideally, you, you don't want to be browsing Instagram while someone is telling you about a stress that they're having. So this is just some broad strokes about support skills that uh, aid in active listening, active and empathic listening. Additional strategies uh, are self-care measures that promote stress management and mental health. And I have a couple of slides coming after this that give some suggestions. We all know about healthy diet. It's hard because it's easier to pick up uh, uh, fast food, but it, it's certainly an important strategy. Good sleep hygiene, solid seven to eight hours a day, regular exercise, um, um, meditation, mindfulness, and I have a couple of slides about that in a moment. And then to build and nurture real life social connections, like if you still remember how to do that, right? So I feel like we were all better at this before um, COVID came and hit us, but we're, we're all having to relearn how to look at other people in the eye again. But it's uh, building and nurturing real life social connections uh, is an important protective factor uh, uh, for workers as well. And of course, then this also speaks about uh, social connections in the workplace. Uh, and it's that, again, fine balancing act of 
creating a, a social uh, circumstance that's functional enough in the workplace that allows people to feel they're in a human and supportive environment, but without exposing them to, uh, to risky exposures. And to then actively appreciate positive experiences. It's not all bad. We've all learned how to run webinars now. We've all learned how to uh, do certain things using technology. So we need to be able to positively reinforce that and express gratitude. And of course, to then um, set goals for wellness and personal life and work to ensure that we have something um, uh, to look forward to. So tea is a good thing. I love my tea. It's nice and relaxing. And I, I just like this image because it, it walks you back and says, uh, you know, remain mindful of what you can control um, and think about uh, what you can't control so you can let it go. Um, and so if, if you need to uh, create some specific uh, cues for the workspace to remind yourself of what you can control, uh, this is a helpful uh, approach. So you can uh, control how you expose yourself to news, bad news. You can control how much kindness or grace you display, um, how, how well you follow uh, health guidelines, etc. What you can't control are the actions of others, predicting what will happen, um, you know, how long distressing events will last, etc. So it's that balancing of what you can control versus what you can't control. Um, so coping strategies in general vary. So some people are very action oriented. Um, you know, they want to get out and run or do something that's going to actively uh, um, modify their experience in the moment. Some people are reflective. They want to uh, go within and just really engage with what's going on. Some people are emotionally expressive and want to share, and some people are reticent, and so they, they prefer to just keep stuff within. And so in designing interventions and spaces in the workplace that uh, are supportive of mental health and provide structures for people to health seek, uh, managers want to keep an eye on the fact that, in fact, coping styles vary and there's no right style there's no wrong I mean, there's no wrong style so whatever is right for somebody it works for them the the ultimate aim is to uh, facilitate uh, continued engagement at a social and occupational level uh, to support emotional regulation and to sustain self-esteem okay so in terms of mindfulness um, mindfulness practice uh, really helps one to um, to come uh, back into themselves and, and gives you an anchor. So some of the strategies um, for mindfulness are represented on this slide. Um, so it's like, you know, when you wake up in the morning uh, to not, the first thing you do is not to take out your phone and check the Twitter feed, even though I'm guilty of that myself, uh, is to focus on your breathing and experience the effects of breathing through your body. Um, in, some, in a future session, perhaps Margot, we could provide some specific uh, mindfulness-based uh, uh, sort of uh, practice, which which I think might be interesting for the group, is to take things easy, um, don't rush, take it easy, take it slow, uh, enjoy something in the morning, like a nice cup of tea, uh, fo focus on the sound of birds, the sound of wind in the trees. So pick something in nature that uh, is is relaxing and calming, and and, and focus on that. As you travel, to take deep breaths and relax. When you stop in traffic, um, um, look around as, instead of quickly checking your social media. Just focus on it. Well, besides the fact that in South Africa, you want to make sure no one's breaking your window. So just be aware of your environment and, and really your breathing and the landscape around you. Uh, I'm from KZN, so there's plenty of opportunities when you drive to work to look at greenery. And, so just focus on those things. When you arrive at the destination, don't rush and unpack your laptop immediately and start working. Just take a few moments to really inhabit your space, orient yourself, breathe consciously, relax before you begin. And at your desk, you know, you become aware of whether you have physical tension. Take a break when you need to walk around. Um, like when we initially started again with COVID, we had booked meetings back to back. I hope, for, I hope uh, we've all now learned to create five, 10 minute breaks between meetings so you can actually get up and walk around the building between meetings just to uh, you know, take the edge off. So you use the repetitive moments for cues for relaxation, um, walking mindfully. So 
just basically being present in the moment when you engage in day-to-day -day life okay and when you get home take a few moments to yourself alone before switching on uh, ENCA to have more bad news uh, and as you sleep uh, actively let go of today and tomorrow and take some slow mindful breaths and perhaps return to the slide of things you can control and things you can't so in terms of meditation it's a question it's really an extension of mindfulness uh, and so you're focusing your attention on a, pro, on a specific changing object uh, or focusing your attention on an unchanging object so it's focusing on something external to you so the idea is to regulate attention willfully and on purpose for relaxation uh, for personal growth and for exploring yourself uh, so uh, again i'm just rushing past that because i'm sure this is not news to you so the, the benefits of meditation are increased energy re relaxation so lower blood pressure improvement in exercise tolerance in improved concentration, less cravings, increased job satisfaction, and improved relationships. So in terms of teams, just to summarize before I move on to the leaders, it's to really honor the individual collaboratively, uh, to create structured and protected time for interpersonal check-ins in a safe, in a safe uh, way, to, pro to uh, advocate for and support um, safe and supportive environments uh, through training, um, and, and, and accessing of resources in the workspace. Um, and it's then provision of adequate staff break spaces. So advocating for those and then using them and supporting, um, supporting uh, their upkeep, creation of spaces to interact and problem solve. Um, so this can be achieved through regular operational meetings where management has to be an active participant um, in, in creating the ethos of the mental wellness space. And is to encourage ongoing support between team members beyond um, just the workspace where it's appropriate. So in terms of leaders, it's very easy for um, us in leadership to have um, a very myopic view and a very single lens focus because ultimately, uh, you know, we're funded to deliver. So it has to be an active choice for leaders to avoid a single lens focus, but to adopt a focus on staff themselves. Ultimately, if a staff member uh, feels that their um, contribution is valued and that their, um, ex their, their living experience is, a, is considered in how the work environment is oriented, more likely to perform better and to, and to feel more valued and uh, and, and more mentally well in the workspace. So um, avoid single less focus, focus on what staff members also want to achieve over and above where they're at in terms of mental health and to address stigma and distrust through capacity building and addressing organizational impediments to seeking help when required. And it's then to then ensure in the workspace that there's provision uh, that there's provision of preventive programming so primary prevention is preventing um uh, before the uh, before the uh, the harm before the uh, disorder is uh, takes place so it's educative talks and information sharing such as these secondary is to then detect early if something is is starting to arise so early detection programs so capacity building around screening and brief intervention um, and then providing um, adequate staff management and training. When something actually it has um, uh, evolved, somebody is now depressed or anxious, it's important that there's either in-house uh, care services that are provided, perhaps through EAP, or that there are structures put in place for referrals. So uh, management needs to be um, and to think ahead and plan ahead for the, this eventuality. There needs to be facilitation of organizational engagement by leaders, and this involves capacitation of leadership to actually know what to look for and what to do, and the facilitation of peer-to-peer -peer platforms, again, in a safe uh, fashion that is protective of, of, of staff members, and supporting of champions and spokespersonship. So to create an environment where championing and spokespersonship is not punished, but is valued and is, is seen to have an impact. On, on how the environment is modified to be more mental health friendly. And it's then of course to develop a supportive team culture. We spoke about how there needs to be regular engagement uh, in, in regular meetings uh, because that 
create a sense of belonging. And creating a supportive team culture really is about how that meeting is actually run. Um, so yes, it's business, uh, but ultimately it's a business that is consisting of people. So the people need to be central to how uh, engagements are, are run. So the, the, the team culture has to be a supportive one. Um, there has to be support for self-help behavior. Um, there have to be in, uh, organizational enge engagements to, to tackle stigma and information share. There has to be advantage taken of external partnerships um, and campaigns. Uh, South Africa is replete with uh, NGO sector partnerships, as well as health sector and social sector partnerships who run regular campaigns. So management must uh, make themselves aware of this and collaboratively with workers engage with external partners to, to share some of these and, and, and sort of also not um, to not take on, uh, on for themselves all of the fixing because some of the interventions are already in existence but to uh, explore what is already in existence through external partners that can be brought in we have alluded to capacitating and support for eaps to provide appropriate support services um, and then of course uh, establishing plans for appropriate assessment and evaluation of outcomes of mental health interventions so just a summary slide for what leadership needs to do leadership needs to model and so embrace vulnerability while protecting the integrity of the work workplace. They need to, while maintaining leadership, be visible and approachable, provide frequent, very clear and informative communication, uh, and then reiterate well-being as a priority by putting those structures in place uh, through EAP, I mentioned through job descriptions, actually listing it as a, as a, as a key performance area, perhaps, ensuring access to services uh, by um, supporting that network development with collaborators external to the company, and then ensuring training and supervision for managers um, in that space. So my team and I, so I'm going to round off in a moment, um, uh, Margot, like motivational interviewing. Uh, so motivational interviewing is a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation um, to change. And it really focuses on autonomy, collaboration, and evocation, um, and focuses on um, um, ensuring that the, uh, the person who is receiving assistance uh, is recognized as the expert on their own life and is a, an active contributor to determining what needs to happen in order for the behavior or the situation to change for them. So these are just some of the principles of MI. I won't go into too much detail. If you, if if uh, if if uh, an MI um, introduction is is of interest, we actually have an MI uh, training coming up, which is free, and you're welcome to join us on that. And I can share information in the chat later, perhaps. So it looks like it looks at uh, tackling stages of change and supporting someone's own decision to uh, make the changes that are required to meet the outcome that they desire. So it's really the core is collaboration and autonomy of the person that is being assisted while evoking what is, you know, the, the, the state that the person is in and using these micro skills um, uh, to, to move them to, to make the change that they want to make. Uh, sorry, that was so messy. Uh, we can do more about that in the future if it's of interest. And then taking those principles and simplifying them, we were talking about being an active listener so a guide on the side uses the principles of motivational interviewing, which is uh, allowing the person to be an expert of their, in their own life, and then looks at incorporating the experience that you've had uh, where you felt supported in a difficult time, and then using that to uh, model the experience that you would like somebody that you are listening to and trying to support. Um, and again, we, we are able to provide some more uh, information around being a guide on the side. So these are just some of the factors which are involved with success uh, in, 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 in clinical encounters, but and beyond. So if you want to create a, uh, a, a successful work environment, you want to create a sense of optimism, a sense of gratitude, a space where people feel self-efficacious and confident uh, to uh, speak up for themselves, to, to access and use the resources available, 
positive affect is reinforced and there's, there, there, there are models for it. And there's a sense of meaning and purpose. So I won't go into the slide, but I just wanted to um, mention these characteristics that one should seek to create in the workspace. Um, so this is just really, again, um, as, I, as I start tying off, to go back to strategies for help seeking. So as an individual, one wants to do that in the workspace, identify um, trusted space, become aware of external alternatives, be familiar with staff support services, uh, explore what it means to be accessible again while striking that healthy balance of professionalism. Um, we didn't focus too much on general home and social life. That's the purpose of this talk is really about the workspace, but um, you bring yourself in. So you wanna make sure that in the home space, you create an environment which uh, also supports your, um, your self-care and, and uh, own well-being. So in terms of yourself, uh, when you're not doing so great, just remember to, again, this, this can be achieved through training, important to be mindful of how you frame symptoms. So seek to normalize and know that you are not alone. This is not unique to you, but others are experiencing uh, variations of that. Uh, to engage in wellness activities and seek professional assistance when required. Uh, and of course, become aware of these resources as well. So uh, that's me, Mother. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see what the folks have to say. Goodman, thank you very, very much for this very insightful presentation. And as you went through it, I could just relate to all of the the the, the, the things that you suggested one should be able to do and one should be, do at the workplace, both from a leadership perspective as well as from an individual perspective. Uh, before we go to the questions, I just wanted to know if you've got any personal advice on, you've got a long list of things what one should do, you know, you should improve your sleep pattern and your, your dieting and, and your creative things and all of that. But if one has all of this in mind, it what can become overwhelmed. So what is your advice for somebody to start a change in your life? Is there a simple way of doing it? Uh, just, just a few pointers there, maybe before we go to some of the questions. I think, you know, the, the, the very low hanging fruit, you always want to try and use the easiest resource available. And if you think about it, <laughs> it's to breathe first. Um, I, you know, usually if we have, uh, we've got quite a lot of people on the, on the meeting today, but as you'll remember, Margo, when we have a smaller group, I'll usually start my sessions with a breathing exercise, and it really does wonders for you. So it's to first just return to that mindfulness breathing practice, uh, taking a step back and just uh, taking a moment and being mindful about appreciating the space around you. So that's the first thing that you want to do. And at the, I'm sure there's, if we all look back, there's a time when we were able to engage in activities that brought us joy um, and brought us some sense of relaxation, whether it's a social engagement, uh, whether it's some sort of hobby. For me, it used to be photography before I became too busy to do that. Um, whether it's engaging with friends or doing a specific activity. So you wanna try and revisit those activities that have previously brought you um, that, that sense. So you don't want to try and reinvent the wheel immediately. First, go back to the, the most available resource, your breath, and then look back at, you know, at, at the past, at things that have reinforced your sense of well-being and start there. And, and following that, you know, we, we, we recommend engaging in social circles to try and, um, you know, to feel like a part of something. But I, I do know that that can be a challenge for some folks. Um, but once once you're able to to get into a social engagement, it's then to share experiences. And this is why we try to talk about peer to peer and supportive structures in the workplace. Share ideas, listen to what people are, are doing and find ways that are easiest for you to access that don't require a complete change, uh, in, you know, that, so that you can make incremental changes. Because the things that are easy to talk about are diet and exercise. But if you find your low hanging fruit within those, then you're able to start having some early wins. Once you have some wins, you can start making the bigger shifts, uh, you know, starting to make some deeper cognitive shifts, start to pick new um, engagements to, to look into. But I think low hanging fruit, breath, look back at what's worked before, try it again, 
engage with others, share ideas, and try things, little wins. Thank you. Very, very good advice. Let's just look at some of the questions here. And one of the questions was that, uh, can depression be hereditary? Is there a link? And uh, then the second one is there are a couple of companies in the UK have introduced a four-day working day. Uh, would this be considered uh, soon in South Africa or can it be implemented anytime soon? And then there's a more complicated question. I think let's just do these two questions first. Before we go on to the other question. Yes, certainly. Um, we do view uh, depression based on current evidence as having a hereditary component. The heredity is, is, is quite complex, so you can't really link it to one specific gene, but we call it so multifactorial. So it doesn't, you know, somebody may certainly have a hereditary predisposition to depression, but we were talking earlier about uh, specific uh, uh, precipitants. So when a precipitant or a stressor uh, is, it presents, it depends very much on what resources somebody has has mod, has, has uh, mobilized um, in order to be able to mitigate that stressor. But to, the short answer to your version is that our current uh, view is that yes, it is hereditary, but that its uh, manifestation um, is is not guaranteed or, and, and and is not uniform. So people present differently depends very much on the nature of the uh, of the precipitant factor and the presence or absence of mitigating factors which can be protective or uh, or, or add to the to the impact of the stressor uh, in terms of the four day week um, I don't know if my team is listening to that if they are please close your ears now I don't need you to hear this uh, I you know for me my you know I advocate for people to be outcome driven. Um, so I've said to my team, if they're working and they need to take a walk on the promenade because they're feeling overwhelmed, that's fine for me. Um, and then they can always update me. I think that, um, you know, we, we, we've spoken about mandates too much, uh, amusing debate on Twitter and other things in the past two years. Uh, I, I think in, in the first instance, companies just need to look at what is their core deliverable? What do you want from your team? Uh, I want my team to be happy. I want my team to feel supported. That's an important outcome for me. But I also need them to take responsibility for deliverables. So I think it's a question of marrying those two. Um, so I, I don't feel either way about the four day working week. I just think we need to reorient uh, around what are we expecting outcomes of the workspace to be. Uh, and it doesn't mean dropping standards. It just means uh, being a bit more flexible about how we get from A to B, but I think it could. I think it could be considered. Uh, I just, I don't feel either way about it. <laughs> I think what I've noticed at our workplace is that some the smokers have got the smoking space far out of the building, and some of the non-smokers actually have sort of followed them or joined them just because they want to get out of the building. They want to have that break, that mental break. And yeah. maybe that's something easy, like you say, low hanging fruit that one could consider for the non-smokers to have something not like smoking, but you know, something similar to have that break. That's right. Um, the the question that might is a bit longer is uh, the question is how can one tell that an employee is ready to return to work after they have been discharged from a psychiatric hospital and a few sessions where they had with the client. In these sessions, the therapist can observe that the client is still struggling emotionally. What could be a way forward when it is evident that the client is emotionally not coping well? It has not been a month since they were discharged from a psychiatric hospital. So I think you get the gist of it. Yes, so I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and be succinct. I think mental health is, 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 is not, um, you know, it's not a tap. You don't, uh, come out of the clinic and you're 100% fine. Um, in fact, most folks who return from time out due to mental health will not be fine for a considerable amount of time and will require ongoing support. So it's not really a question of thinking about the fact that somebody must come back fully fixed because chances are they won't come back fully fixed, but it's about creating an environment where um, there are resources and support for them to keep making gains. So there are tools available that can uh, objectively measure readiness to return to work. 
one just has to balance that with not being an impersonal and still making sure that the environment is actually a supportive one, as opposed to a check a checklist, uh, total oriented uh, review. So that's a very short answer, Matema, and I'm sure that it doesn't fully answer what what you want to hear. But I hope it begins to. I think uh, your question probably needs another half hour of discussion. It's an important one. Can you see the question by beauty? I can. So it's not a question, but I'm currently in the employee wellness space, and she complains about the the cost of the, of the service, not necessarily the return on investment. Um, Thank you, Beauty. You know, maybe you want to say something about that. I absolutely agree with you um, that the cost is definitely barrier, but ultimately the uh, return on investment is fantastic. Um, and 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 you know I think the buy-in from uh, from staff is, is is something that you 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 know if if the environment supports them as individuals uh, will be automatic as well. So yes, I I thank you for the comment. Yeah, and and maybe this is the time where I just want to ask uh, uh, participants to indicate you you mentioned that you might uh, be interested in in providing a session on mindfulness or practical exercises something like that. So if you could, in your comments, please let us know if that would be something that you would be interested in, then we could certainly consider that. that. Um, the other question here is just a question about the presentation. I think the uh, conference secretariat will share that with everybody. And as you know, the certificates will be available next week. And um, here's something else in terms of functional limitations, reduced productivity due to anxiety and depression. How can one communicate this with the supervisor, especially when the stated interventions and strategies are not implemented? A bit vague, but I don't know if you want to venture something on that. So I think this really speaks to uh, the provision of adequate training to leadership. Um, so the environment, uh, in order to facilitate development of a mental health friendly environment, there has to not just be resources in place, but adequate training around detection, around supportive strategies, and around capacity, uh, you know, in general for support. So I think that's the beginning. Um, yeah, that's the beginning. Yeah. Let me see. Have I answered the yeah. question? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it all relates to what you you stress so much as to creating that safe environment at at the workplace, yes. uh, which is very important, you know. Then Eva has, yeah, um, she mentions, yeah, like the work hardening approach for returning workers from ill health, but how can managers balance the need to restructure work for the affected worker and the need to recover lost time and production at work against the expected outcome? Very difficult balancing position, but you, if you want to add anything to that. I think that's part of what, you know what the managerial role is. It's that's part of the role is you're constantly ba balancing opposing priorities, um, and uh, you know this this also speaks to the previous comment is that upfront investment um, in creating a wellness space uh, can only yield results after a little bit of of give. So there has to be a little bit of uh, investment in 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 the space first. Um, and only then can the outcomes then be, be monitored. There's just no, you know, you can't expect change without uh, making change. Um, so you have yeah. to invest in it because the data is very clear uh, of the losses. Um, so we know that there's losses about around, related to mental health. We know that people who, are, who, who receive mental health care become better functioning. And so we know that. And so it's just a question of getting the commitment to make those changes. I'm answering very quickly because we are short of time. So I apologize yeah, yeah. if I'm not giving your, your question sufficient care. I, I think the it sort of touches on the next question, Mark Eva, where she talks about the grief and the fear in society and that we should adapt our, our workplace practices accordingly to create that safe space. I think that is also, you know, on a more personal level here, Martin, who says that he's been diagnosed with depression, is on treatment, but he's still, and gets enough sleep, but he's still very tired. Is that because the medication is not working? So, you know, Martin, it's, it, you know, it, it's, antidepressants are interesting in this way. You know, everyone responds differently to, to different agents. Um, and so some medications have some adverse effects. Some of them are sedating. Some of them result in longer sleep. 
Um, some of them uh, cause other somatic issues. So, you know, this is a conversation one would advise you have with your treating therapist or psychiatrist um, in that it's either the response is good, but the adverse effects are haven't yet worn off because they tend to in time, or the uh, functional disorder, the depression itself, hasn't been adequately treated yet. So there's just a bit of a titrating, titrating game that needs to take place sort of to, to, to tackle that balance between side effects, which uh, may take some time to, to, to improve uh, versus the actual improvement in the disorder. So sometimes it may take a bit of time to find the right agent for you. And once the right agent has been found, it might take time to get to the right dose for you. So there's quite a few complex considerations. But of course, as well, you wanna think about the rest of the picture. So how are you supplementing the treatment? What's your diet? What's your activity level? What other psychosocial interventions are you uh, engaging in? I think the uh, OT here makes uh, they do a functional capacity evaluation to return to work measures. I think that's yes. a very, very useful thing to do. Yes. Um, and then just to the secretariat, Monica, then, can, did you see this here, mental health webinar? It's about teenage substance abuse. So it's next week's webinar. Maybe I should just remind everybody that next Wednesday, the 17th of uh, August, uh, Professor Ratamani will talk about uh, adolescence and substance use, and especially in the in the in the wake of the tragedy in East London and in, in your Beni uh, Tavern, and what happened there, and also and just in general. So please be on the lookout. We've also got on the twenty fifth of August the Women and uh, Mental Health a talk on that, a webinar on that. Uh, I think if I scroll down. There's a lot of interest on mindfulness, paranoid schizophrenic successfully integrate in mainstream working environment. I don't know if you want to tackle that quickly. Oh, goodness me. I think, I think anybody uh, who is adequately treated can be reintegrated into society. Um, so it's the question of finding the right medication and the right dose. Um, and of course, ensuring that they've returned to a functional level that's safe for them um, and the work environment. So it is definitely possible for anybody with a mental health diagnosis to return to the workspace. But again, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's not a tap, so you don't just switch it off. So there does need to be ongoing support and uh, ongoing um, uh, intervention to support the, the, the gains. And there's a question on the lack of finances and how to overcome it. One, two. You know, it's, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier about intersectoral collaboration and and making use of existing resources. So, if if a company is completely unable to provide any in-house uh, resources, then the responsibility then is to create SOPs for referral to uh, external collaborators. So, to create, uh, you know, perhaps screening-based referral triggers for public health care, social services referrals. NGO sector referrals. So there are ways to get around that if the finances aren't available immediately. And I think a few questions about uh, if you notice that your colleague is not well, then, you know, how do you manage that situation? And it also reflects on if you notice that your supervisor is not well, how, how do you, is there something you can do? Or, please advise them. So again, it's a question of what policies are in place, right? And this, this for me goes back to that comment I made about to what extent do workers feel empowered to participate in creating the space? Because if there's a co-creative space that says, how do we create an environment where um, we can support the well-being of everyone? Then part of that engagement is about what are the steps we take when we see um, that there's an issue? And that there's not gonna be a one size fits all here. It's going to depend on the nature of the organization. I work in a department of psychiatry and mental health. Everyone is a mental health provider. So the, the, the pathways for health, for, health, for health accessing might be different to somebody who is working as a contractor in a, in, in a, in a construction company. So it needs to be uh, uniquely tailored to that, that, that specific workspace and also take into cognizance what resources are then available. Because you know the part of the responsibility when it comes to detecting is then uh, creating a safe space to then refer to. So if, if a company is going to put in place practices to detect, 
the responsibility of the company is then to say, where, where does this person go? What is the next intervention? What is the network of, of supportive structures that needs to be put in place? So there's no one size fits all answer here. It's a compact that has to be negotiated based on the industry, based on the resources of the organization, based on the linkages uh, to external resources that the company is able to arrange. But again, for me, the critical thing is there has to be active involvement of all parties from leadership to staffing, to EAP, and to those collaborative partners as well. Yeah, I think what, what COVID showed us is that uh, your mental health is one of the core uh, attributes of your functioning world. And uh, so I, I think it was ignored for a lot of many years and many ages. And it's time that it, it gets the recognition that it, it requires to be, be fully functional and to, to make your contribution to your, to your work and to your working environment and also to your life and your personal life at home. Um, I think we're going to end there, Goodman. If you want to maybe just give a parting uh, message, maybe a short message to everybody, and then hopefully, uh, yeah. Just wow, I'm just really, uh, uh, really thrilled with all your engagement. Now I wish I'd spoken for less and allowed us to engage a bit more. Um, but you know how we are, uh, we uh, academics uh, like to hear the sound of their own voice. So that's what happened. But thank you so much for your time and, and, and thank you for engaging. And I hope this has triggered some, uh, some stuff for you to think about. And I hope, look forward to seeing you in a future webinar sometime.